أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والحمد لله رب العالمين بارئ الخلائق أجمعين باعث الأنبياء والمرسلين ثم الصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء وسيد المرسلين حبيب إله العالمين المصطفى أبا القاسم محمد الله صل على محمد وعلى محمد الرجيم وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المنتجبين الذين أذهب الله عنهم الرجس وطهرهم تطهيرا اللهم صل على محمد وعلى أما بعد فقد قال الله تبارك وتعالى في كتابه المجيد وقرآنه الحميد وقوله الحق أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وخلق الإنسان ضعيفا صدق الله العلي العظيم صلوا على محمد وآل محمد اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد The human being brothers and sisters when you compare him to the other creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you find him unique. For example, the other creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala don't have a struggle. You don't have, for example, a sun struggling with itself. Should I rise in the morning or shall I not rise in the morning? And you have a part of it says, no, it's too early for me to rise. Let me just rest for a little bit more and then I'll wake up and get up. Or the moon saying, no, no, you know what? I'm too tired. Let me just take a break a little bit. I'm been working night and day and day and night. You know, night here, I come up. Then it becomes daytime. I don't rest. I go to the other side of the globe. You know, and I, I, I come up on the other. So always difficulty. You don't have that struggle in there, for example. And you find, for example, when you compare it to the animals, the human being needs some nourishment, needs some caring for needs to be supplied with the tools he or she needs to grow up. Whereas sometimes if I have animals, in many cases they are born with all the tools they need. They have the claws, for example. When they grow, they start using them. It's not that the mother, for example, or the father would give them this claws and say, hey, now you should wear this. They have the fur, for example, that covers their bodies. It's not that the mother needs to tell them, now it's winter, you need to wear this fur. They have the equipment or the tools necessary. Allah gave it to them. They have these. The human being, however, no. He needs to acquire these tools. He needs to get them. Plus, he has a continuous struggle inside him. There is a continuous struggle. So, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala refers to this in the Quran, in this ayah that we just recited, Saying, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, wa khuliq al-insanu da'ifa. The human being is created weak. Weak. This weakness implies, one, the physical weakness of the human being. Yes, indeed. You find this a human being comes to this world, doesn't know anything. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about the human when he comes out from the womb of the mother, وَاللَّهُ أَخْرَجَكُمْ مِنْ بُطُونِ أُمَّهَاتِكُمْ لَا تَعْلَمُونَ شَيْئًا That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brought you from the womb of your mothers not knowing anything. And it's true. You find a child, a baby, when he comes out, does not know how to speak. Even speaking, he doesn't know how to speak. He learns to speak. الرحمن علم القرآن خلق الإنسان علمه البيان بيان means communication language Allah gave him this language he doesn't know it he comes out otherwise you take a human being you put him in the middle of nowhere he won't be able to speak he doesn't know that language the human being doesn't even know how to walk he learns walking through looking at the adults in the family for example he looks at his father his mother his older siblings walking he learns how to walk Otherwise, he may not even think of how to learn how to walk. He doesn't know how to do that. He is so weak, if you leave him by himself or herself one or two days, he will die. He will not be able to get his food. He will not be able to survive. He needs the clothing. You have to give him, the mother or the father have to give him the protection. 
that he requires. So very weak. Indeed, the human being is grown initially weak. And then slowly he starts to gain his strength. Slowly he starts to gain his powers. But then there is an additional weakness that strikes this human being. And that weakness that also is born with the human as well is not just the physical weakness, but rather the spiritual weakness. Spiritually, he is weak. Intellectually, he is weak. Psychologically, he is weak. And that's why Islam puts a great emphasis on the parents when they raise these children to make sure they feed this into the life of the child, feed the spirituality in his life. You know, there is an Arabic poet who says, لا عذب الله أمي إنها شربت حب الوصي وغذتنيه في اللبن وكان لي والد يهوى أبا حسن فصرت من ذي وذا أهوى أبا حسن He says, may Allah not ever punish my mother. Why? Because she drank the love of Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam. Sharibat hubb al The love of Ali ibn Abi Talib. She drank it and she fed it to me with her milk. So the milk of the mother does not just give the nutrients. And this has been shown. That the milk of the mother does not only give nutrients, but rather spiritually feeds this child. Spiritually feeds the child. So my mother fed me this love of Ahlul Bayt. Fed it to me. And I had a father who used to love Ali ibn Abi Talib. وَكَانَ لِي وَالِدٌ يَهْوَى أَبَا حَسَنًا He used to love Ali ibn Abi Talib. So from my father and from my mother, I learned to love Ali ibn Abi Talib. You find this, Islam emphasized this spiritual growth. Teaching the children about the love of Ahlul Bayt, the merits of Ahlul Bayt, making them grow in this love of Ahlul Bayt. One day, Abu al-Aswad al-Du'ali, Abu al-Aswad al-Du'ali, the companion of Amir al-Mu'mineen, sallallahu alayhi and to whom the Arabs attribute the establishment of Arabic grammar. They say he is the father of Arabic grammar, Abu al-Aswad al-Du'ali. We believe that Ali ibn Abi Talib, sallallahu alayhi taught him. He taught him the laws, the basics, and he told him, now write a book about it. So one day he arrives in the house and he finds his daughter eating honey. He tells his wife, where do we get honey from? This is a luxury. Where does it come from? Who brought us this honey? The wife said, a man brought it as a gift from Muawiyah ibn Abi Sufyan. He gave us this honey. So he turned to his, he turned to his daughter who was eating from this honey. And she was three years old according to some traditions. Three years old. He told her, listen. Do you know that this honey came from a man who hates Ali ibn Abi Talib? Salam Allah Who is the enemy of Ali ibn Abi Talib? She said, really? He said, yes. So she put her fingers into her mouth and she threw out this honey that she ate. She said, such honey we don't want. And then this three-year-old started reciting verses of poetry where she started saying, Abi Shahd al-Muza'far, Yabna Hindin. Do you think that honey that you have made nice with saffron, you put some saffron in this honey, you think with this honey you, we can, you can buy our religion from us, you can buy the love of Ali ibn Abi Talib from us? She says, never, wallah, never. Our master is Ali ibn Abi Talib, salam allahi alayhi. This is indeed something that, how did she learn it? This three years old. How did she have this love of Amir al-Mu'mineen, sallallahu alayhi, of Ahlul Bayt? It's taught to her by the father, by, by the parents. So teaching them spiritually, teaching them psychologically, emotionally, making the child stronger. You find some children who have great confidence in themselves. Even though if you take a look at them, you find them maybe they are not the best in the school. They're not the best students in the school. Yet they might be the ones who succeed in their lives. And you have a child who is good in the school, but he may not become successful in life. Part of the reasons is that the parents keep telling this other child, the one who is not very smart, let's say, not very good in school, they tell him, you are good, you will be successful, you can succeed. And so he grows up in this psychological environment. Emotionally he feels that he is good, he can succeed, and he does. 
He does. On the opposite, you have a child who is successful, smart, but the ch parents might destroy him, shatter him, or don't nourish him, so he won't succeed as much. Same thing, intellectual advancements. You find this human being born without any intellectual concepts, yet slowly he starts to grow and nourish such that you find him building skyrockets. And, for example, you find him building these high-rises where he lives in 120-story buildings. Even though the human being himself cannot exceed maybe two and a half meters in length and height, yet he builds these tall high-rises. How did he come up with all this? You know, it's all a development that he went through. Yet, this human being, brothers and sisters, has some internal struggles, internal struggles, internal issues that he has. Such issues do not exist in the universe. Universe, as I mentioned, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who created everything, like Musa alayhi salam, when he tells Fir'aun, my Lord is the one who created everything, thumma hada, hada, he gave it guidance. Everything is guided by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The human being, Allah showed him the guidance, the path of guidance, but he chooses. He gave him the free will to choose. So he has this internal struggle. So the struggle that we see, it is not in the world, the struggles that we see, the issues we see in the world, it is not a struggle as some people perceive between Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the devil, Iblis, Shaitan. No. What is Shaitan compared to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Allah al-wahidu al-qahar. Al-qahar. Qahar means all paramount, all mighty. In other words, nothing can stand in his will or, or in, 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 in the face of his commands. Nothing. So what is Iblis? He is powerless, helpless. The struggles we see in the world are the human being. The, the, the problems of the human being. The struggles of the human being. As the hadith says, every human being, the heart of every human has two ears. You know, sometimes they draw in cartoons, you know, they draw, for example, an angel on one side and the devil on the other side, trying to whisper to the man, you know, the angel says, don't do this, and the devil says, no, do it, for example, or vice versa. So the angel tells him, be good, the devil. The hadith implies something similar, where every heart of every human has two ears. One is basically where the malaika, the angels, are telling, or the human conscious is speaking into him. And the other one is the human's desires, his desires, his anger is trying to speak into it. And that is the internal conflict, that is the internal struggle. This internal struggle then is reflected on the outside in the world. So you have people fighting wars, destroying lands, causing corruption, and others, no, they're trying to make peace, trying to make justice. And so that's when the clashes occur. That's when the clashes. You have people of haq and people of batil. People on the truth and people on falsehood. This is all stemming from the internal struggles of the human being. Now, a person might say, well, why bother with the struggles? Just leave us, leave us, let us sit alone. I don't want to bother. Like for example, that companion of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi who in the battle of Safin used to go and pray behind Amir al-Mu'mineen Sallallahu Alaihi And at the time of food, he goes to eat with Muawiyah ibn Abi Sufyan. And when they fight, he goes on a nearby hill sits on the hill or on the mountain and observes. He doesn't participate. So he was asked, why do you do this? I mean, which side are you on? He said, neighbor, no, nobody's side. Praying behind Ali ibn Abi Talib is better for my religion. But eating with Muawiyah is better for my stomach. And when they fight, let them fight. I don't care. This is none of my business. You know, they have problems. Let them sort it out themselves. You know, this, of course, is a false ideology. That ideology is false. Whenever we are faced with haq or batil, one has to take a stand. One has to take a stand with haq against the stand with batil, against the stand of batil, against batil. Allah says, وَلَوْلَا دَفْعُ اللَّهِ النَّاسَ بَعْضَهُمْ بِبَعْضِ لَهُدِّمَتْ صَوَامِعُ وَبِيَعٌ وَصَلَوَاتٌ وَمَسَاجِدُ يُذْكَرُ فِيهَا اسْمُ اللَّهِ كَثِيرًا 
And if it weren't, if it weren't for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala choosing some people to stand in the face of others, then you would find monasteries, places of worship, temples. You would find synagogues, churches, and mosques where the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the names of Allah is mentioned in them constantly. They would be destroyed. They would be destroyed. And interestingly here, Allah mentions all places of worship. All places of worship. And we find this truly in the message of Ahlul Bayt alayhim salam In the path of Ahlul Bayt, you find they defended places of worship irrespective of what they worship. Never do we have Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi destroying, for example, ordering the destruction of places of worship. So, Amir al-Mu'mineen salam Allah alayhi the same thing. Islam respects them. Lakum deenukum wa liyadeen. You have your religion, we have our religion. Allah, so you don't want to accept it, no problem. So these struggles exist within the human being. Now, a question might arise as well. So when we are faced with a difficulty, we have to take a stand. We have to go with the haqq. We can't just keep quiet. Otherwise, there will be problems in the world. The question that maybe some people arise is, so why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala create the human being weak? Why couldn't Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give him the ability to make all the right decisions, do all the right things? In response to this, we say then, what is the difference between him and the animals, if that is the case? The human being becomes just like the animals in that case. Animals also, Allah gave them a path to live. You find, for example, the bees of honey, those who make honey. The bees, they lived this path for the past, I don't know, thousands of years since Allah created them until the day of judgment. Well, they will never develop themselves. They will never, for example, go and seek to become better, to improve their lives, to improve the production of honey. Why? Because that's the way Allah created them. They don't have this ability that makes them strive to become better. So Allah gave us the desire. Allah gave us the anger. And Allah gave us the aql, the mind. So we can utilize it to become better, to improve our lives. If otherwise, we would become just like the animals, the cattle, whatever Allah created. And then the next question is, okay, so if that is the case, why Allah creates all this corruption? First of all, Allah did not create the corruption in the, in the land. Allah created the human being and gave him that ability, the ability to make corruption, gave it to him but also guided him, told him, this is right and this is wrong. Now I will leave you. It's up to you to decide what you want to do with it. The reason Allah did this so that the human can strive, the human can move forward, the human can excel, can exceed, can get up, can realize there is a conflict. And this conflict is what drives him, what pushes him to improve. In fact, interestingly, some scholars and thinkers says, what really drives history? History, what does drive, what, what makes history? What drives history? And the response is the struggles, the struggles. Some thinkers say that it is the struggles of the human being that drives history. You have some people who always look for corruption and to achieve their corruption, they spread whatever means that they could use. They keep people in darknesses, they keep people in lies, they make people uneducated. On the face of those people, you have individuals who want to cause, no, peace, who want to cause education, who want to result people and elevate their status. You have a Habil and a Qabil. You have an Ibrahim alayhi salam and you also have Namrud. You have Musa alayhi salam and you have Fir'aun. You have our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Alih and you have Abu Jahl. You have Ahlul Bayt Alayhim salam and you have the other opposing rulers that they lived through. You find them, they wanted those enemies of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, wanted to destroy the religion, wanted to spread their own agendas. But you have people standing in their faces and calling that by God we will not give you our hands like slaves. Or like people who have humility and do not have dignity. Nor are we going to run away like slaves. So this is in the path of Ahlul Bayt. This is the path of Ahlul Bayt alayhim salam. Having said this, 
The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam says in a hadith that this world needs four things to be established in a peaceful way. What are they for? One, alimun yasta'milu ilmah. A alim, a knowledgeable scholar who uses his ilm, uses his knowledge to teach, to educate. Alim. Second, وَجَاهِلٌ لَا يَسْتَنْكِفُ أَنْ يَتَعَلَّمْ And an ignorant person who does not feel too arrogant to go and seek knowledge. Some people, unfortunately, have that arrogance. Although he doesn't know anything. But he says, no, I am a alim, I am a scholar. And we'll come to that, inshallah. وَغَنِيٌ جَوَادٌ بِمَعْرُوفِهِ And a rich, wealthy person who gives, who is generous. He gives. A rich person who gives. And four, وَفَقِيرٌ لَا يَبِيعُ آخِرَتَهُ بِدُنْيَا غَيْرِهِ And a poor person who does not sell his akhira, his own akhira, for the dunya of another person. For another person. That is the problem. He says the Prophet ﷺ continues. He says, فَإِذَا كَتَمَ الْعَالِمُ عِلْمَهِ If the scholar, the educated one, keeps his knowledge to himself, doesn't teach it to others. And, وَزَهَلْ جَاهِلُ فِي مَا لَا بُدَّ فِي تَعَلُّمِ مَا لَا بُدَّ مِنْ And the ignorant does not go to seek the knowledge that he needs to learn about. Abu Hanif and Nu'man sat with Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam had discussions with Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam until finally he confessed and he said that you are right, Ya ibn Rasulullah, I will stop teaching what I'm teaching. Imam alayhi salam responded back to him. He said, Hayhat hubbur riasati laysa bitarikik. He says, no. The love of authority is not going to leave you alone. You like this authority. It's not going to leave you. So you have an individual who claims to be a alim, yet upon a discussion with Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam, he confesses, I don't know anything. I don't know much. I don't know much. But this is causing problems now in the world. If the alim stops teaching, and if an ignorant person continues on his ignorance without seeking the right guidance. That's why Imam al-Jawad says, لَوْ سَكَتَ الْجَاهِلْ لَمْ يَكُنْ اختلاف. He says, if the ignorant one keeps quiet, no problems in this world exist. Problem is when a person who thinks that he has some ilm, some knowledge, and starts spreading his knowledge to the people. What else? وَبُخْلُ الْغَنِيِّ بِمَعْرُوفِهِ وَبَخِلَ الْغَنِيُّ بِمَعْرُوفِهِ and if the poor per or the rich person becomes stingy with his wealth by giving, he becomes stingy. And for الْفَقِيرُ دِينَهُ بِدُنْيَا غَيْرِهِ حَلَّ الْبَلَاءُ وَعَظُمَ الْعِقَابِ He says, and if the poor person sells his akhira for the, another person's religion, then you will find حَلَّ الْبَلَاءُ Corruption, difficulties will come. And عقاب, punishment, punishment. Amr ibn al-As had a struggle, had a struggle within himself. Had a struggle. Whether to stay with Ali ibn Abi Talib or to join Amir al-Mu'mini sallallahu alayhi or to go with Muawiyah. Muawiyah was continuously writing to him, come, come to my side, come join me. And he would offer him, he would tell him, I'll give you this, I'll give you this, I'll give you that. Finally, he gave him Wilaya to Misr, the governorship of Egypt, which was a big thing by the time. In fact, until this day, the leadership of Egypt is a big thing, you know, apparently. But back in those days, also it was a big thing. So he accepted, he accepted finally and shifted sides. He shifted. One day, Muawiyah was talking with him. He says, Ya Amr. Your price was very high. Your price was really high. قَالَ وَإِنِّي لَمَغْبُونَ He said, but I'm still at a loss. You say my price is high. It's still too little. It's too cheap. I'm the one who's losing. 
I'm the one who's losing. He said, how come? You've been given the governorship of Egypt. What else do you want? He said, I sold my akhirah for your dunya. I'm selling my akh. Subhanallah, ya akhi, ajib Allah. The person knows exactly what he's doing. But he chooses. He chose. Allah. I'm selling my akhirah for your dunya. Not even his own dunya. The dunya of Muawiyah ibn Abi Sufyan. He sells it. He gives it to him. Khalas. And so he tells him one day when Muawiyah took him away from the governorship of Egypt, he, wrote, he writes a whole poem to Muawiyah ibn Abi Sufyan and he tells him, you have no right in taking me away from this, this post, this position, because this is not your right anyways to assign or to, to not assign. This is not you. You and I fought against Ali ibn, uh, Ali ibn Abi Talib, salam Allah, and you and I know very well that we're on the wrong side. And you and I know very well on the day of judgment, Ali will be with Haq, with the truth in Jannah, and you and I will be on the opposite side. And then he tells him, And how can you compare the dust to the stars? And how can you compare Muawiyah to Ali? You know, subhanAllah. This is, but that is the struggles within the human being. So these struggles are there, they exist. But the human being has that potential, has that ability to excel psychologically, spiritually, intellectually. He has all these potentials if he can, of course, face these challenges. A person cannot just say, you know what, the struggles are too much. I cannot handle them. And therefore, he becomes like Amr ibn al-As, for example, and goes with that flow. No, this is not. A person needs some factors. Some need some factors, important factors. One, he needs hope. A human being must have the hope. These are some of the internal factors he needs. Without hope, he won't be achieving much. There has to be this hope, this optimism. The optimism. You know, like Winston Churchill says, he says... An optimistic person finds an opportunity in every calamity. And a pessimistic person finds a calamity in every opportunity. So when a, a, a problem arises, an optimistic person sees an opportunity in this problem. Says, let me seize it. Whereas a pessimistic person, no, every opportunity that comes, he sees it as a problem, as a calamity. You know the cliche that says the glass is half full. And some people see it half empty. Or you make a dot in a page, a white page, and you tell a person, what do you see? The natural response of many human beings say, I see a black dot. Say, what about all this white that's around the page? A person just goes immediately to the black dot. You know, this is done even in psychology classes. They do this. If you go to a psychology, very early psychology classes, one of the beginning lessons they teach in the first classes is they, the teacher would put up this black dot on a page, on a white page, says, and ask the students, what do you see? You find the students, many of them say, we see a black dot. He says, what about the rest of the white around that black dot? Don't you see that? They say, yeah, we see it, but it's the black dot that catches the attention. So the human being needs, needs this opportunity, the, Optimism. He needs to have that optimism. Second, he needs to have the confidence. The confidence in himself. And the confidence that he can change the state of the affairs. The situation. He must have that confidence within himself. That you know what? The problems that are on my head here, that I'm faced with, these are not forces that are, you know, holding me down and are tying me down and I can't let them go. No. These are issues that I need to face them and go fight them. Sometimes you have people who sit down and say, my God, I don't know where to start from. There are so many problems I have, so many issues. I don't even know where to begin. You need to sit down, relax a little bit, have a cup of chai, you know. And think, clear your head and start thinking just by sitting down and saying, what am I going to do? How am I going to solve this problem? This will not solve this problem. Getting angry will not solve this problem. 
getting upset and stressed is not going to solve the problem. One needs to sit down and relax and think, how can I resolve this issue? Knowing the confidence inside, I can resolve it. They say to every disease, there is a medicine, there is a cure. You know, but we may not have discovered it yet, but there exists one. Third, we need to have the rely on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Rely on Allah. We need to have the faith in Allah, the rely on Allah. You try this. These are internal issues. We also need practical points. What are the practical points? One, patience. Patience. You need to have the patience. Patience is extremely important. Like Amir al muminin says, a faith without patience is like a body without a head. You need to have the patience. And second is the perseverance. 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 Those two points as well. Practical points. So we have three internal issues. And we have two practical issues what we need to put into perspective. The Prophet وسلم, tells us, be aware of two qualities. Don't have them. What are they? Al-Dajaru wal Kasal. He says, giving up and being lazy. Those two problems. Giving up and laziness. He says, don't have these attributes, these qualities. You find some of the Muslims today, they are sloths, mashallah. They sleep and khalas. That's it. Mashallah. That's it. All they do. You have a koala, for example. The koala is an animal that sleeps 18 hours a day, mashallah. You know, 18 hours a day, it sleeps. And gets up and eats this eucalyptus, you know, leaves, and then goes back to sleep as well. That's why when you see a koala in the zoo, it's so boring. You know, yes, the animal is very cute. But when you see him, he's just sleeping. That's it, you know, doesn't do anything. So when the koala wakes up, you find them making an announcement in the zoo. The koala actually woke up, you know, go, go see the koalas now. They woke up. They make an announcement. You have sometimes really the, some people are like this as well, mashallah. Just sleeping 18 hours a day, you know. And if they can in Ramadan, they will do that as well, mashallah, 18 hours a day, you know. They would love it, mashallah. Yeah. It is truly, you know, a problem. So, he says, the Prophet continues, giving up and perseverance and, and laziness. He says, إِيَّاكَ خُصْلَتَيْنَ الضَّجَرُ وَالْكَسَلِ فَإِنَّكَ إِنْ ضَجِرْتْ لَمْ تَصْبِرْ عَلَى الْحَقِّ وَإِنْ كَسَلْتْ أَوْ كَسَلْتْ لَمْ تُؤَدِّ حَقَّا If you become, if you give up, you would not be able to be patient on the haqq, on the truth. You give up, خلاص, I can't do this anymore. So let me join Muawiyah's side. That's it. And if you are lazy, then you will not be able to deliver the truth to its people. You will not be able to give it off. Muhammad ibn Abi Umayr was in the prison of Harun al-Rashid. This man was a alim. And he was a wealthy man. He was very wealthy. He was rich. He was a businessman. They arrested him. They put him in the prison of As-Sindi ibn Shahik. The same prison where the Imam, Salamullah alayhi, Imam al-Kadhim was put. Not at the same time, but different times. He was put in the same prison, the same prisoner, as Sindi ibn Shahik. Harun sometimes himself used to attend the punishment and the persecution of Muhammad ibn Abi Umayr. He personally used to come, the Khalifa himself used to come to see him. Why? What did they want from him? One thing. They wanted the names of the Shia. Tell us, who are your followers? Who are the followers of Imam al-Kadhim alayhi salam? The followers of Ahlul Bayt, who? Give us the names. That's all we want. They would take a stick made of wood. They would put nails into the stick. And they would beat him with it. At one point, Muhammad ibn Abi Umayr says himself, he says, I was about to confess from all these beatings. I weakened. It was not easy. They used to beat him. 
He says, but then I hear the voice of the cell next to me. A voice came from the cell next to him. There was a man by the name of Muhammad ibn Yunus ibn Abdul Rahman. He was one of the true ulama as well. When I weakened, I was about to confess, I heard him saying from the cell next door, Yabna Abi Umair, Tadakkar Mawqifaka Bayna Yaday Allah. Remember the day when you will stand before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What are you going to say? He says, this gave me the strength. One word, one sentence. So brothers and sisters, sometimes all you need is one sentence of encouragement to the people. Give them the support. Give them the encouragement. That's what makes leaders. That's what helps people to change. One sentence. He says, that gave me the strength to face all this oppression and aggression and persecution until finally he was let go after years of imprisonment. He came back and he lost all his wealth and he lost his eyesight as well from all this persecution. He became blind. A person who narrates the story, he says, him not expressing the names of the people cost him 100,000 dirham, 100,000 silver coins, because he did not mention any names. The prize was 100,000 dirham. He kept quiet. He had a struggle as well in the inside. He had a struggle. It was not easy. But he came out victorious. He came out winning. He did not side with the batil. And that's what Ahlul Bayt want of us, brothers and sisters. They want us to follow the truth. These struggles we will have internally all the time. We will be faced with these issues and problems. We have to stand up for haqq and face them. We need to have the optimism. We need to have the confidence and the faith that we can make a difference. We need to rely on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We need to be determined and we need to be patient. You do this and slowly you'll, Allah will illuminate the path of haqq for the individual. Like Muhammad ibn Abi Umair. At the time when he weakened, Allah sent him the voice of Muhammad ibn Yunus to help him, to give him the boost and the power and to remain steadfast. And you find the followers of Imam Hussein sallallahu alayhi his companions on that haqq, on that path, not giving up, despite the difficulties they had to face, despite the problems they had to face, the persecution they had to face, they stayed on the haqq until they all were killed one after the other. Imam Hussein Salamullah Alayhi stood there on the plains of Karbala and calling them, Ya Habib, Ya Zuhair, Ya Burair, Ma li ad'ukum fala tujibun. Why am I calling you? and you don't respond to your master. But how can you respond when your heads have been separated from your bodies? He stood there, and then he started calling for help. And all of the sudden he finds a boy whose face is so bright and shiny a man who used to resemble Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi. Ali al-Akbar walks out of the tent. He looks at him. This is his son coming to his father and says, Father, give me the permission to fight before you. And what a difficult thing for a father to tell his son. Yes, go and fight. Go and get killed. So Imam Hussein raised his hands. He said, Allahumma shahad ala haula al qawm O oh Allah, bear witness on those people. فَإِنَّهُمْ دَعَوْنَا لِيَنْصُرُونَا They invited us to support us and then they went against us and started killing us. 
So Ali al-Akbar went out fighting in the battlefield calling Ana Ali ibn al-Husayn ibn Ali Nahnu wa baytullah awla bin Nabi I am Ali ibn al-Husayn ibn Ali We are defending the Prophet's family and he fights bravely Imam Hussein alayhi salam rides on his horse he waits for that moment until the cry is made Aba alayka minni salam Hada jaddi rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi Wa qad saqani shurbatan la azma'u ba'daha abada He says, oh my father, ya Aba Abdullah Assalamu alayk, here is my grandfather Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi He sends you his salam and he has given me this drink after which I will never go thirsty Abi Abdullah rushes to his son What a difficult moment, historians say he threw himself from his horse to the body of his son crying Waladi Ali Ali Ala Dunya Badakal Afa Oh my son Ali I wish I had never lived to see this moment Ibn Sa'ad Qata Allah Rahimak Kama Qata Rahimi Ah Then he carried he then he couldn't carry him. He called Bani Hashim. He said, Ya Bani Hashim, Ta'alu wahmilu Aliya. They came and they carried him to the tent. And that's when his mother came by and started crying, Aywa walada wa Aliya. أنا قطعت منك نصيبي يا ابن ردتك ذخر الأيام الشيبي إنا لله وإنا إليه راجعون وسيعلم الذين ظلموا أي منقلب ينقلبون والعاقبة للمتقين Is your hands for dua, brothers and sisters بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم أما يجيب المضطر إذا دعا ويكشف السوء 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 اللهم إنا نسألك وندعوك باسمك العظيم الأعظم الأعز الأجل الأكرم يا الله 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 إلهي بفاطمة وأبيها وبعلها وبنيها والسر المستودع فيها اكشف عنا السوء يا الله اللهم اغفر ذنوبنا كفر عنا سيئاتنا وتوفنا مع الأبرار اللهم اقض حوائج المحتاجين شافي وعافي جميع مرضى المؤمنين والمؤمنات اللهم اغفر لي ولوالدي وارحمهما كما ربياني صغيرا اجزهما بالإحسان إحسانا وبالسيئات غفرانا رب اجعلني مقيم الصلاة ومن ذريتي ربنا وتقبل دعاء اللهم عجل لوليك الفرج واجعلنا من شيعته وأنصاره وأعوانه والمستشهدين بين يديه اللهم كن لوليك الحجة ابن الحسن صلواتك عليه وعلى آبائه في هذه الساعة وفي كل ساعة وليا وحافظا وقائدا ونا ودليلا وعينا 
حتى تسكنه أرضك طوعا وتمتعه فيها طويلا برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين اللهم أرنا الطلعة الرشيدة والغرة الحميدة واكحل أنظارنا بنظرة منا إليه اللهم ونقسم عليك بالزهراء فاطمة إلا ما رزقتنا شفاعة الزهراء يا الله يا الله يا الله لقضاء الحوائج ولشفاء المرضى ولكشف هذه الغم عن هذه الأمة ولتعجيل فرج مولانا صاحب العصر والزمان وإلى أرواح المؤمنين والمؤمنات لا سيما أرواح مات الجالسين والحاضرين رحم الله من يقرأ السورة المباركة الفاتحة مع الصلوات الله صل على محمد